The following episode contains discussions about suicide and self-harm. The information shared is one individual's personal experience and is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice, medical diagnosis, treatment, or care. If you or a loved one is struggling with mental illness or has suicidal thoughts, don't hesitate to reach out for help and dial 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline or proceed to your local emergency room. In our last episode, we sat down with the inspiring Jasmine Samson, a young artist and mental health advocate, where she shared her story of battling depression, self-harm, and numerous suicide attempts, noting these challenges starting as early as age 10. Today, we're joined by Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at Carrier Clinic, Dr. Eric Alcera. He will help us unpack some of Jasmine's story from the perspective of a psychiatrist and as a father. So Dr. Alcera, thanks so much for coming in today. Jasmine shares a story with a lot of deep emotions and sharing just what she's gone through. And I'm really curious to get your take on it, you know, like I said, as a dad, as a doctor, and just see what you think. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to meet Jasmine and uh, hear her a little bit of her story. Um, she's a very brave young lady. And uh, her, her ability to put into words the feelings and emotions that she went through is so helpful, not just only for her, but for the people that are listening. So. Uh, it was a, she's she's a very powerful courageous young lady and it's always a pleasure to meet her so yeah she was amazing and that was going to be my first question is if you know Jasmine personally or just know of her story so I do you're familiar uh, with it yeah I was able to uh, meet her at one of the events up at Hackensack University Medical Center and I heard her story for the first time and it was very very moving um, she is uh, again she's she's very eloquent with the way she speaks and I think she speaks with courage she speaks with uh, you know, bold truth, and I and it, it's it's insightful for the for the listener to hear, especially for those that are suffering and really can't put words to emotions. For sure, I felt the exact same way, and just how well she can articulate what she went through too is also amazing. But yeah. we'll get a chance to kind of unpack all that today. I've picked out clips from the conversation I had with her that I'd just like to show you, and we'll play them, and then we can just kind of talk about what you think, or you know, what your advice would be for somebody maybe going through something similar. Sounds good. All right, great. So let's get started. So the first clip I have for you is her kind of sharing a little bit of her backstory um, about her family, how she grew up, and it's gonna kind of just set the scene for um, everything she's gone through, so. So I came from an immigrant household. My parents were kind of the first generation who came to the States, and I actually, couldn't speak English English for the first few years. I had to go to ESL. And they, my parents were in this culture where mental illness didn't exist. It wasn't addressed. And they had no concept of what it was or any idea. And they always held high expectations for me. Yeah, that's a powerful clip. Um, you know, her story about having coming from first immigration first first generation immigrants is uh unfortunately it's a it's a it's a story that everyone shares i think that it's something that resonates with a lot of people and kids uh that that are part of that first generation and really being the sort of um children of being in a new place and 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 trying to learn different new things i think mental health we all know that it has a stigma um i think it's even more pronounced in in other cultures that are outside of the western world and i think With her case, you know, she speaks about it that, you know, the fact that she recognizes it, she understands that this is the challenges that she faced, albeit in retrospect, um, it's good insight. I think part of what I would love for people to understand is that this story is not uncommon, right? We have many people that have similar backgrounds, have similar challenges, and will face mental health and uh, how do we address that? How do we educate and give them the support and resources to get them the help that they need? I'm, I'm, there's no question that, you know, as first, Im- first generation immigrants coming here, knowing the resources and the mental health layout is a challenge, even for those that live in our area. So for them to try to navigate that and get the help for their daughter, it breaks my heart. I mean, to think about it, you know, it's, it's hard, I, I, you know, as a psychiatrist that deals with it every day, I know the challenges and the barriers that it's faced, and it becomes even more pronounced for for families that have to deal with this for the first time, and they're not in, and they're in a new setting, they're in a new environment, new culture, everything. And I think this is something that we as a community really need to come together and, and help 
first generation immigrant families you know understand that there is help out there and there's resources that are out there to help them definitely what do you also think of i don't even think it has to be a first generation i'm sure it's stronger too when you're coming from such strong like cultural roots but i feel like the kind of denial of needs for mental health is in a lot of different cultures like what do you think about that like how can we continue i guess like breaking that mold yeah it's a good point i think it's you know you're going to have stigma with mental health no matter where you go i think people have either they're not experienced with it they're they haven't been affected by it which in this day and age is kind of odd to even think about that it doesn't affect them but some of them to your point could just be in denial and and, yeah. and not and you know you'll get over it that sort of you know put your head to the grindstone nose to the grindstone you'll get through this you know it's i mean i think that that those are old traditional ways of thinking of things and we have to think of things differently right what we've learned about mental health is that it's affecting our kids it's affecting our families um, suicide rates are going up. We have to be able to talk about this, and we have to be able to speak to families and educate them. Um, you know, schools play a, a, an important role. Uh, you know, c- religious associations and communities and services they play a role. Anything that can we can that their touch points are that we can educate about mental health is going to be really important to break that stigma. Absolutely, you brought up a point about just the rising rates of suicide and just you know, mental health conditions happening for younger people. Uh, And I wanted to bring up, because I'm reading this book, it's called The Anxious Generation. And the the author is going through all these different data points sharing, you know, how after 2010, these numbers just have skyrocketed. And it kind of coincided with the release of the iPhone and people having, you know, smartphones in their pockets at all times, access to social media. And this will be part of the conversation as Jasmine shares a little bit about, you know, how the internet played a role. But I'm just wondering your take on that and just kind of like that stark change that we've seen in like 15 years. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's undeniable that the correlation between increased anxiety and depression and even suicide is related to the access to the internet, right? I think, you know, one of the things we always forget and you know even though jasmine's a young lady now this affected her when she was an adolescent and we have to remember that adolescents are impressionable right and so when you're given a device that gives you information that you're not ready to hear that becomes a little bit problematic right it's a double-edged sword sometimes it could be really helpful it could provide social interaction but if the information that gets to them can't be interpreted it can't be talked about it can't be discussed or sort of just teased out it can become problematic for kids i mean i back in the days when the internet came out we talked about things like cyberbullying i think it's evolved now to you know vilifying social media and all of them play a role i just think that you know when we talk about social media we have to look at the internet as a whole i mean no one talks about google but that's Mm -hmm. probably one of the biggest search engine youtube all of those you know internet apps that allow kids to get information um that could with unlimited access with unlimited too. access that's exactly yeah right. so it's intense we'll get through that yeah. but all really good points all right so this next clip is um jasmine's parents response to her talking about her struggles for the first time so i'd love for you to take a look my parents they weren't a very strong support system for me when i was younger because again they didn't know what it was yeah when I first opened up to them about hurting myself they took me somewhere to eat sat me down and said it's just a phase you'll get over it everyone goes through this feeling and I felt very invalidated uh, and that was their reaction to the initial telling them about it well you know it's uh it, it's hard because you know if you're a listener listening to that the first thing to think is they're such bad parents right? I know and and the reality is that it's not that they're bad parents right it's just that they're not informed right Mm -hmm. so i i don't know what jasmine's parents backgrounds are but you know to deal with mental health you you need training right and you have to be able to speak and have conversations with your kids tough conversations that's not easy for anyone um if that is not sort of a practice that families do early uh in terms of knowing your kids talking to them learning how to ask really hard questions you know when you're faced in the moment of crisis that's not the time to learn 
right? And, and one yeah. of the things I like to I like talking to parents and educating them out is learn how to speak to your kids, learn how to speak and have conversations, and learn how to have tough conversations. You know, try to try to use opportunities, whether it's watching a movie or an experience they see on the news, to talk about it and, and ask them how they feel and what they think about it. I think these are important concepts of not only learning how to, you know, as a parent, learning how to speak to your kid, but you don't want to learn these things in the moment of crisis. It's unfortunate in Jasmine's side that, you know, when she reached out for help, her parents couldn't couldn't provide the help that she was looking for. And I don't blame her parents. I mean, uh, there's a lot of parents out there that are faced with mental illness with their kids and they don't know what to do. And, you know, they have to reach out to resources, you know, bring them to the emergency room, go to the schools, ask, uh, you know, you know, a, 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 a priest or like a, you know, a religious uh, leader to help them sort of navigate all this. But it's, um, I don't want people to think that Jasmine has bad parents. I'm sure that they had great intentions and they loved their lo they loved Jasmine. They just didn't have the knowledge base and the resource information necessary to get him the help that she needed. So, yeah, when I heard it, it was I'm a parent too and I just felt so pulled in so many directions yeah. because one I felt bad for them saying like they don't know how to handle this in the situation and then I also felt really poorly for her that I'm yeah. that she couldn't find that support. And I think you brought up a really good point about like starting these conversations earlier so that it's not in the time of crisis where they're like, all right, let's have this deep talk about like how you're feeling. I think it must be really challenging for people who've grown up where conversations about feelings and your mental health were never had. So no. parents are probably tackling this for the first time too, saying, I'm going to change how I raise my kids. Um, do you have strategies that you use at home with your kids on, you know, how to talk about these things? You know, it's 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 funny that you mentioned that because it's I always think back when I was younger, like what was the hard conversations I had with my parents? And it's always about the birds and the bees. That's always like the first one that you talk about. <laughs> at That's, least they had it with you. Right, Some parents had, don't do it. They do. And, and <laughs> I think, you know, um, I think part of what I struggle with is you have to be able to meet the kids where they're at. You know, uh, when I speak to my kids, they're two different maturity levels, so you have to learn how to adjust. I'm trained to do that. It's hard for some parents to do that. And I think recognizing the challenges, that some kids aren't um, able to speak in a way that you'd want them to speak, um, that becomes frustrating. And, and I think part of it is lower your expectations, right? Meet the, meet the kids where they're at. There was a simple, there's a simple technique that I always tell them, instead of asking how your day was, ask them what is the most interesting thing that happened to them that day right it's those type of questions allow different frameworks and mindsets and perspectives to you know have the kid think i i tried that once with my kid it still didn't work one day it did <laughs> but i think you, you have to try i yeah. think you, you know you i often hear from parents that you know i've tried this it doesn't work and they give up i think you have to just keep pushing to try to keep that engagement you know one of the things about trust is that you it can't be developed unless you communicate and communication is hard in kids you know Kids will communicate in ways not like adults do. And you have to find that commonality, whether it's through hobbies, whether that's through art, whether that's through nonverbal communication, whether that's through play. Um, there's different ways kids can communicate. And it's not always about let's sit down, let's have a question and answer, and let's go from there. Um, I think you know parents know their kids the best. And if you still struggle with, with talking to your kids, you know, the easiest thing I say is go talk to a school teacher that has a close relationship with your child and, and, and see what they do and talk to them in, in terms of how they communicate with them. Or you could seek a mental health professional to do that. But I think you know communication is key. It establishes trust. And if you can do that with your kids early, you're, you're, in, a good, you're in a good space. I love those tips you provided. One, asking a more pointed question, a, like something random too like yeah. what was the funny part of your day right. or what's something that's weird that happened um just to kind of get a different response because you know if you come home from work how's your day it was good oh you know like we're automatically inclined to kind of yeah. give those you know standard answers right. and then i also really love the idea of that these conversations don't have to take place when you're in you know a serious setting sitting on the couch and you're ready to open up like you could be having a catch or like taking a walk or getting ice cream and just being able to be there and connect with each other that's right it's all really good stuff all right awesome all right so now we're getting deeper here um this next clip is talking about kind of what led her to self-harm um so we'll jump into there so at what 
age do you think you started to realize like something I'm feeling isn't isn't normal or it doesn't feel right? Probably. Well, honestly, in elementary school, I had a lot of insecurities and maybe more so than other kids, but I thought it was normal. I thought, oh, everyone gets super self-conscious and insecure. And maybe the very, very point that it happened, I think I was 10 years old, and I got a letter home from school saying like, oh, your child is overweight and you need to address that. And I saw it before my mom did. And I just like extreme body issues and just really hating myself for something that, for something like that when I was so young. And it just kind of spiraled more when I was up to when I was 13. And a lot of the people, my friends around me at the time were also engaging in self injurious behavior. And that was what gave me the idea to also start doing it for myself. I was like, oh, if that's how they cope, what if I started doing it? That brings up a lot of sort of emotions and feelings in my head. I think it's, uh, you know, I, when I hear that, I think about all the adolescent girls that really struggle with body image. And, and you know, adolescents in general always are going to be questioning their, their confidence and whether or not they're how good are they you know they're at the age especially around 10 that jasmine says they're looking at their peers and they're starting to compare themselves like am i prettier am i stronger am i more creative and more athletic and so on and so forth so developmentally that makes sense from that part i think once we start talking about image it's such a powerful thing in our society that we look at but it's so it could be so damaging if it's not presented to an adolescent girl in the correct way and i think this is this is a big thing that the media has to be accountable for. This is a big thing that f parents have to be accountable for. We have to learn how to teach confidence in our kids, especially our young girls, that it's not just about their image, that, th that confidence comes from many forms, that you are good, whether it's the way you draw, the way you care for your siblings, the way you study, there's so many things. But image, for some reason, just sticks with a lot of kids because of the culture that we have uh, here in the United States. And I think it's it's something that's really problematic. Um, the other thing that sort of resonated with me is that it's important to understand that when we, when we don't have good coping skills, when we don't have good tools in our toolbox to manage emotions and distress, we will often model uh, the behaviors of our peers. And so when she sees someone that's self you know, doing self-injurious behavior, her, her her first automatic reaction is well if they're doing it maybe it work it'll work for me and and that's sort of oftentimes it's never it's it's learned it's mimic it's role model self injurious behavior it is a maladaptive coping skill but it's a coping skill that when the emotions get too stressful they end up doing things that change that feeling whether it be from a physical cutting of themselves or hurting of themselves and that's maladaptive and i think this is where we really need to work with our adolescents you know communication becomes so important i know we talked about that sooner but being able to express your feelings being able to understand that when these emotions happen how do i manage it how do i navigate it right and kids aren't going to be able to do that one-on-one -on -one, and maybe they're not even going to get that from their peers which is why it's so important to have a relationship with a parent with a coach with a teacher to to have these conversations and say how does it make you feel what you know what are you going to do with it who can you talk to and and really give them those tools that they need to manage it in crisis it you know one of the things that i think has been emerging over the last few years is teaching kids coping skills you know you see it all everywhere mindfulness um meditation yoga uh breathing right all exercise all of that really helps in those moments and it's stuff that we never we talked about sort of singularly but we never connected it to mental health not until late and i think it's a it's something that's really important that schools hospitals teachers everyone has a responsibility to help kids with um we often do it in crisis i see the kids all the time when they come into my office or in our emergency rooms we try to teach that but again it's not the time to teach that we yeah. need to really implement this as this is part of your just like physical health that we have in school this is part of your mental health like i would love to see instead of having phys ed there's a there's a you know mental ed in, yeah. in school to teach them that you know when things like this happen you know this is what you can turn to i think that would be a great 
great thing to add in, in high school curriculum. Absolutely. Yeah. It's training. It's yeah. like you don't just say, I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow. Right. You know, you've been working up to this point so that you can get through that race and do it well. And that's the same thing, like you're saying, kids coming to the ED, it's not, that's not the time that to start training or to start running that race. It's like they needed those skills ahead of time, which is huge. Yeah, that clip really is so heavy. And yeah. I just feel for her that this is that's where she could turn to because she didn't really feel that she had support in other angles and like was like oh well that looks like a good alternative it's just it's really sad but um yeah i think you know with special needs kids and i always tell parents this is uh you know when you when you get a license you can drive a car but just because you have a license doesn't mean you can drive a truck right you're going to need training when you drive something that big so when you have a kid with special needs you could fall back on traditional parenting but you really need help and support when you're dealing with someone that's struggling with mental health. And so if parents can recognize that early and really seek out the support in their communities and, and you know, through HMH, you know, they'll, they'll have a, the abilities and the tools to manage that in terms of crisis. That's great. I mean, for parents looking for that kind of help, what what's out there? Is it like uh, support groups or how can they get this information? So there's tons of information. I mean, the school really at that age in adolescence, the school becomes really helpful in terms of getting the resources out. There are a lot of organizations online. Uh, NAMI becomes a really important access on the web. That's N-A-M-I? N-A-M-I. What does that yep. stand for? National Association of Mental Illness. Don't hold me to that. I think that's what it is. (laughs) If anybody wants to look it up, I want to make sure they can spell it. But uh, NAMI has a lot of great information and educational tools for parents. Um, The American Academy of Child Lessons Psychiatry, the American Pediatric Association, all have terrific things on their website about education and dealing specifically with anxiety and depression with kids. That's great. So the pros and cons of the internet, you know? Yeah. We have resources available. Good stuff. Um, All right. So this next clip is her talking about the first time um, of trying self-harm. Do you remember the lead up to like the first time you were going to try hurting yourself? It must have been because of school. Mm -hmm. And it must have been... I love my parents, but... uh, Everyone has a difficult time handling their emotions, and perhaps they lashed out at me, got angry for some reason, I didn't do a chore, whatever, and um, something about finishing an assignment and just feeling extremely overwhelmed and really pressured and feeling like I was a failure to my parents, a failure to my school, to my friends, just a a lot of self-doubt, a lot of internalization, a lot of negative self-talk just a lot self-deprecating thoughts like I'm I hate myself I, I'm a bad person things that weren't true and feeling so overwhelmed crying having a meltdown pure meltdown about it and just seeing a blade and being like okay maybe this will help and in that moment it did so it's interesting to watch her talk about how she was feeling overwhelmed school was a stressor i think school is a common stress that a lot of parents and kids can relate to um but you could see as she's talking about how she's she's feeling overwhelmed and anxious she's putting into words that and remember this is happening when she's younger there must be something wrong about me right it she talks about it now as an adult looking back but she's talking about she was self-deprecating she's saying you know I'm not good enough, I'm a failure, right? Those internal negative talks are very common with kids that struggle with anxiety and depression, right? They're, kids are often most critical about themselves. Um, and if you hear that enough, it can definitely lead to you know clinical depression and anxiety. And obviously in this case, it led to self-injurious behavior. Now, it's interesting, people are gonna wonder, they're gonna say, you know, she took a blade and she cut herself and all of a sudden it helped. Um, How could that possibly be? And I think one of the things about, you know, depression and and self-injurious behavior is that when you're feeling so overwhelmed from an emotional state and you don't have the ability to decompress that by either using words or deep breathing or anything else and that the only coping skill that you have is to cut and that creates a physical sensation of pain, which is a sort of a release, which is why she's saying it helps. We, I know that sounds a little bit bizarre, but the reality is that there is some benefit to cutting, which 
obviously is a very provocative statement, but it's something that when you're working with kids and doing therapy, you want to validate that to some degree, that it's, we understand that, you know, you, you, you tried to help yourself, but we have to give you better tools and better ways to manage that. Um, kids are looking to relieve themselves from the emotions. And it is up oftentimes at this point when they're cutting, a professional really has to teach them and tease out that when you're recognizing those stage-wise patterns of the feeling of being overwhelmed or you know, first it's school stress. School stress leads to being overwhelmed. It leads to feeling bad and having self-doubt and negative thoughts about myself. And then it leads to cutting. You need, a therapist needs to put in every phase, what could you do here? What coping skill could you have done once you start thinking of that? How do you recognize that so you don't allow it to progress to the next step? And I think, you know, in, in Jasmine's case, it's, um, she learned that over time that the moment she felt that way, I'm just going to cut because it's just easier. And there was no one to help her sort of break that pattern of in, of, of, of trending upwards to, to stop that. But that's the treatment. That's We have to be able to help them at every point in time and really sort of tease apart what is what are the triggers that get them from one level to the next until the point of self-injurious behavior. Yeah, it was definitely alarming for me not quite understanding it at the time when she's saying, you know, like it, it helped. I was like, wow. Yeah. But then when I thought about it, I realized she was experiencing so much emotional anguish that I'm sure like a physical pain was a relief to get her brain off of, I guess, like the, the emotional pain she had. Yeah. It was very um, eye opening for me. Um, the next part, uh, I don't I don't have a clip, but I, I definitely want to talk about this. So she talks a little bit about just how self-harm was kind of romanticized on the Internet. And that's how she learned how to do it and how um, she would go. I forget which sites she said, but it basically told you, like, you know, how deep to do it and how you can clean up afterwards. And um, I also aside from you know like the safety aspect of saying like okay well if you're going to do this this is how you should do it um i guess what are your thoughts on that kind of information being available like do you think that that's good that it's out there no <laughs> it's not good that it, i mean i think it's out there and we have to we have to sort of talk about it you know it's uh i think people are going to put on the internet what they're going to put out and you know whether it's right or wrong is 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 neither here nor there in my opinion. I think it's it, whoever's listening to it has to understand, and we have to help that person understand. You know, we could talk about things being on the internet and whether it's right or wrong, and but uh, the reality is that you know it's like video gaming. Is video gaming bad? Right? Should we stop it or get rid of it? And I think mm -hmm. you know I think that conversation often becomes circular because it really doesn't address the issue. Um, you can get rid of it it might show up somewhere else like we you know the recent legislation about getting rid of TikTok is let's get rid of TikTok and everything will be better in terms of you know social media I ask my kids what happens when you get rid of TikTok and they're like well we'll just watch Snapchat like it's just <laughs> we're gonna pivot we're, we're gonna yeah. pivot right I, and I think part of part of the problem with sort of seeing these things on the internet is we could talk about whether they should be there or not but that doesn't help the kid mm -hmm. right what helps the kid is to understand that you probably are going to see this on the internet and what do you do when you see this right when you see a provocative thing you know forget about being it's self-injurious behavior but when you see something disturbing and provocative what what does that invoke in you what is those feelings that you're feeling and who are the people that you could talk to about that so that it doesn't become sort of confusing inside of you that you have to do something adversely or maladaptive to it right yeah when when i was thinking about that um it kind of and we don't have to go down this rabbit hole if you don't want to but um kind of remind me of like how there's you know safe spaces for people to use drugs like we'll come and we'll make sure you have safe needles and i was like this is kind of like the same like if you're going to do this here's how you can do it um it's just a very complicated yeah that's a complicated <laughs> question i think yeah. we won't go down that rabbit hole but because I, I think there's you know in in the world of psychiatry there's two parties to each yeah. that believe that it's a good thing and a, there's another group that believe it's it's not good again i think at the end of the day our goal is to stay focused on how do we help people manage their addiction and just like how we help how do we help jasmine manage with her emotions and feelings right yeah i'm also going to jump back to kind of like a media conversation i don't know if you remember it was 
probably a couple years ago now, there was a Netflix show that came out. It was called 13 Reasons Why. Yeah. Do you, are you familiar with it? Heard about it. Yeah, and um, I, I was just, it, it reminded me of that when I was thinking about this because it's this whole story following a teenage girl who had committed suicide and it kind of is a look back as she sends messages, you know, to people kind of from, you know, not the beyond, but she sends uh tapes and yep. kind of like lets people know how they like impacted her journey and it really um it was an emotional show and uh i think it was a washington post article shared saying how suicide rates had increased like a lot after this show yep. had aired and i'm just wondering again when it comes to like media and the internet like how do we obviously you can't stop your child from watching every single thing right but what are you the tips that I guess you have to kind of safeguard yeah. from something like that. I mean, it's difficult. Let's just recognize that, yeah. right? I think it's, you know, I grew up in the age of if it's rated G, P, G, or R, right? Your parents would pause and say, you know, can you really watch this? Should I follow the guidelines? I think, you know, it goes back to that kids are impressionable, adolescents are. So when they see provocative things like this, um, it can go either way. I mean, I've had kids talk about you know th this this movie and uh it didn't affect them and it you know part of it is because i think most of them that that it didn't affect had the ability to sort of have the emotional um healthiness to understand what what it means talk about it sort of put it where its place was that this is a movie it doesn't relate to me but if you put that in front of a a child that's impressionable <coughs> or an adolescent that's impressionable and they don't know how to deal with emotions. They don't know how to deal with these provocative, really polarizing events and hearing it. And then they see that part of the coping skill is to, you know, either cut yourself or commit suicide. That becomes, a, that becomes problematic. And I, and I think we have to realize that as a society that the things that we put out in this world have to be um, understood that there's gonna be consequences to that. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm fairly certain that the people made the movie kind of understood what what could happen. I just didn't think, you know, it was pretty. I remember when it came out, there was a lot of cases of patients coming in to the EDs and they were suicidal and there was cutting and all of it referred back to this. And I think, wow. you know, there's the sensation of sort of mimicking and modeling, you know, kids again, kids are impressionable when they see things like that. If they don't have the coping skills, it's uh it's a bad recipe. Yeah, that's horrible. Yeah. What do you think, I guess, is the most vulnerable age? And I'm sure this also relates to, like, brain development and yeah. all of that. So I guess at what point can we say, all right, you know, maybe you're a little better equipped to know what's what's a good idea, what's not? Yeah, it's hard. You know, when we talk about age, it's, we have it gives us a general idea. I try to stay away from it because it's really about maturity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are kids that are 9 and 8 that have the maturity of a 14-year-old. You know, I know my friends in their 40s have the maturity of a 9, 12-year-old. So it's, <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it changes. Um, I don't think there's a specific age. I think it has to really focus on what experiences the child has had, um, what what kind of language and, and, and ability to communicate they have. I think if you have those abilities, um, you know, they're, they're able to sort of manage these things in a much better fashion and a much more mature fashion than those that don't. Right. So. I think that's the easiest way to object, you know, to place an objective way of viewing things versus just age. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this <coughs> next one um, is it's it's similar to what we watched, but her reflecting about you know how it felt and wanting to do it again. Because when I was asking her these questions, I thought maybe maybe that first time would have kind of scared her, or maybe she would have been like, "Oh, that's not." I didn't know her story, so I didn't yeah. know that it kind of progressed down this route. So just looking for your thoughts. Was that something that you were kind of like, okay, well, this helped me, so maybe I'll do it again? It was more like this felt good in this moment, so I'm going to keep doing it every time I feel this way. So those thoughts, because all, all those thoughts, once I did it, just dissipated. And I was like, my final thought was more so like, I deserve this. Yeah, I mean, if you go back to her prior clip where she talks about some of those thoughts, I think if, if you think about, um, 
you know, when, when you're stressed and you hear the negative thoughts, the, you know, those sleepless nights and the things that sort of keep storming in your brain, right? That intrusiveness, those thoughts of why am I thinking this way and I can't stop myself, um, really becomes aware on your psyche as a whole. And I think, uh, you know, Jasmine saying that when I, when I did, when I cut, I felt the relief and those thoughts stopped. You know, if you use that model about, you know, people that have been traumatized and they watch and they they see the images in their head of, you know, the bad thing that happened to them. Um, oftentimes when I when I speak to them, especially those that are suffering from uh, substance use, it, they use it because they realize that the moment they use it, it actually stops those thoughts. You know, the that intrusiveness becomes really problematic in, in mental health and learning how to cope with it comes in many forms. Um, you know, people can run, people can exercise, people can have conversations, they can go for a walk, they could do whatever they need to do to stop those thoughts. And I think people have learned to do that. Um, I know that if I play video games sometimes, or I play like Candy Crush on my phone, it'll stop those thoughts. Why wouldn't I keep doing that? Right? Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't, unless Jasmine learned a different way of managing her emotions, why would she stop? Right? And that's, that's the thing that a lot of um, non-professionals sort of don't understand like it's so bad like why would you cut and keep doing it there is a sense of relief which I mentioned earlier that provides them that relief of stopping the thought what we really need to do is teach them there are different ways that th that's not going to hurt yourself that's going to help you and help you grow and 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 develop in a much more mature way um, and I think you know Jasmine has developed that over time but it took time to do that yeah so. learning all those skills yeah. Um, you mentioned it's a repetitive behavior that you see a lot of that, you know, it's not really like a one-time thing. Um, do most, do most who kind of go through these, you know, self-injurious, I guess, periods, do they, do you often see it lead towards like suicide attempts or does it, it kind of stay in this realm sometimes? I mean, it could, it oftentimes, you know, if you're doing self-injurious behavior, it's really not talking about the, if the injurious behavior is repetitive, that's going to lead to suicide. The self-injurious behavior is a result of intrusive thoughts, depression, anxiety. And if that's not relieved, that will often lead to suicide. Yeah. So that although they're intertwined, it's not directly the self-injurious behavior that leads to the completed suicide. It's the underlying mental health that can't be resolved or can't be integrated with an adaptive coping skill to stop that pattern of rep repetitiveness of self-deprecating thought of intrusive thought of negative um, self-talk that just is a constant reel in patients heads that they just wanted to stop yeah in in your i guess entire journey and career as a psychiatrist and seeing this do you feel that it's happening to people younger and younger. I just, I can't get over the fact that all of these emotions hit her when she was 10. It really, yeah. I'm just, that's so young. I don't know. I'm a bit jaded because I've worked, been working with children and adolescents for over 20 years now. So it's um, the trauma that a lot of kids face and the anxieties that they face on a daily basis is, uh, it's not uncommon for me. I think it's, you know, there's no doubt that the, the statistics have shown that anxiety and depression have gone up. Um, I think COVID sort of made a point in that. And, you know, there was an undercurrent that just sort of, it, 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 we often blame COVID-19 for this, but it really wasn't. It was always there. Mm -hmm. It just became heightened. Suicide rates were always high um, within this age range, you know, always, you know, sort of the top two uh, lead causes of death in kids. So I think it's um, it's always been present in kids. I think you can sort of, attribute the internet of giving information um and putting out you know media and 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 movies and things that kids would nor normally get if they didn't have a f something in their hand as as part of the problem but again i don't think it's the only problem i think it's yeah. stress and anxiety is a normal part of life that we have to learn how to deal with unfortunately the the world has gotten a lot more complicated and uh you know i, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole but you know with the division in politics, war, and these things that, you know, just keep pop up in current events, it, you know, these are things that kids have to navigate in addition to being a normal teenager, dealing with the regular s schools of stress, dating, you know, peer relationships, all of that. You know, when you start compounding those things, it's definitely going to increase some stress and anxiety when you're younger. Yeah. 
the world itself is insane, but I also think it's the accessibility of knowing that insanity yes. that like constantly you're bombarded. You know, you open Instagram and you're seeing something else and something else and something else. It's just, yeah. it's like endless reminders of what's going on. And it's instant, right? It's not, yeah. there's no delay. There's no, I think back in the day, there's... It's not like you're waiting for the nightly news, you right. know, it's like... And, and to some degree, you know, I talk about kids being impressionable and, you know, some of the things is that we've gotten away from the idea of community. I think, uh, you know, when kids are on their phone, I think back when I was a kid, most of my information I got from my friends and that requires mm -hmm. to, you know, for a kid to be social. If a kid can get all their information and they're just chatting on text, it gives a false sense of socialness, which I think is a little bit of a, you know, it's a big problem with kids that really need to learn how to navigate um, day to day and face to face. So I, 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 you know, I think part of it is the more we can instill community back in kids, I think that's really, really important. Absolutely. And it's reminding me back to this book. I'm sorry, I can't get over it. But they talked about that and how, you know, years prior, it was like 60% of kids found themselves playing outside with friends after school. And yeah. those numbers now are like, I don't know what it was, like 10%. Yeah. And you mentioned that just kind of those interactions are just different. Kids are still communicating with other people. It's just very different. It's a very different form. And I, you know, I, th I think it's... Um, you know, we have been accustomed to say, like, you know, we're going out, we're playing, we can navigate things. I think it's, there, there's a different persona or avatar that you put on when you're behind a camera, mm -hmm. right? And if you're not really, if there's, it's hard to sort of fake it when you're in front of the person, partly because not only are you hearing my voice, but you're seeing my body language mm -hmm. and the way I move. Remember that communication is not only through voice and, and verbal communication but it's the way i interact it's my facial expressions it's you can read that and then place that with the words and you have much more richer deeper meaning to a conversation than than texting on a phone yeah, yeah. and kids are also just learning by everything kind of being written or photos it's like it's very much like brand management of yeah. like how do i how am i perceived online it's a whole weight that i think older generations never had to deal with right um it's insane insane yeah um so the next clip is her talking about her first hospitalization experience i'm really excited for you to see this one um not that it's a good clip but um just for your reaction on like sure. how it was for her it was only it was very short term it was mm -hmm. about three to four days i think at the time because I didn't have an attempt, I just came to my counselor and said, hey, I'm hurting myself, I need help. Um, because also when I told my parents, I was like, I need a psychiatrist, I need a therapist, and they were like, no, you're fine. I was hoping that getting to the hospital, I would be provided those things, and I was. It was very underwhelming, and it just gave me a terrible impression of the whole industry itself because it felt very clinical it felt very apathetic and like they were just doing their job and I was out of there so it wasn't a great experience wow so I just have to put things in perspective she's I don't know Jasmine Jay's I'm guessing she's in her 20s mm -hmm. and this is probably happening so that we're talking about 10 plus years ago um, Ten years ago, I, I can't fault our profession, right? I think we've learned a lot I in the last 10 or 15 years, and I think uh, that is probably a pretty accurate description of what happens on an adolescent unit, if not in an emergency room. I think we've, uh, you know, we're often sort of faced to manage acuity um, in that simple way, right? It's very sort of, what are the symptoms? It's a very medical model, right? What are the symptoms? What are you feeling? What's your diagnosis? Here's the treatment. You have X amount of days to get it fixed, take a couple medications, see your therapist and go home and we'll deal with it. I think we've learned a lot over the last couple of years in terms of understanding um, how we should manage adolescents um, in our emergency rooms. You know, we've developed you know, separate areas for, for kids to uh, get treatment. We have child psychiatrists, um, you know, stationed in our emergency rooms now that are able to provide that specialty care during those moments of crisis. So um, I think we still have a long way to go and opportunities to improve. But I, I you know, I, I just think about 
things like a CPEP model, which stands for Comprehensive Psychiatric uh, Pediatric Emergency Programs that are in emergency rooms in New York City. I think about our own programs that we have here in uh, at Hackensack Brittany Health. You know, we have areas that are designed for kids when they come in and how to deal with it, you know, separate from the emergency room, away from the hustle and bustle, talking to specialists that are trained to engage them in a in a way that's much more engaging and not sort of that um, medical model of, you know, what's your chief complaint mm -hmm. and, you know, tell me when it happened and just it, it's there, there. We're learning better ways to manage manage things. I'm not saying that it's perfect. I think the system still has a long way to go to to help kids, but it's it's not surprising to me that, you know, looking back ten or plus years ago, that's probably what she got, um, and I think it's not uncommon today. I think in some hospital settings, I think we're really lucky here at HMH where we've had the ability to really institute things like, um, you know, the you know child psychiatrist teleservices in our emergency room, having um, you know the pediatric psych collaborative to help you know pediatricians manage some of this stuff. I think we're we're getting better as a specialty, but I think there's a lot of opportunities to improve. But it's I, I think it's it's not uncommon to hear stuff like that back in the day. Yeah. Well, thank you for answering it honestly, because I was like, this is an interesting one to share. It's it's not a good health experience. No. Um, but I'm really glad to hear that there's been so many improvements made to try and make things better and to make it more personalized. Because when she said that, it did feel like it was kind of just very clinical like okay well you're here you're safe now and then we're gonna set you on your way and you know you'll go figure it out then but it sounds like we're moving in the right direction for sure yeah i, I think you know at carrier clinic you know we have a big expansion coming up in our child and adolescent stuff and i i think you know i'm really excited to be part of sort of developing new ways we can connect with with kids we're working with a lot of uh companies to talk about using visual healing using space and artistry and, and colors and just sort of adding that as a in addition to the great service that we're already doing now and i think the more that organizations and 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 mental health specialists recognize that there is nuance to how we treat kids especially younger kids as we as uh, as they struggle with mental health issues um the better off we're going to be and you know i always say it takes a village so the more that we can we can give them the better off they're going to be for sure. And your mention of art will segue us nicely into the end because Jasmine is an artist. Um, Perfect. But this next one is kind of like the progression of her moving from self-harm and to then a suicide attempt. Throughout hurting myself, I was always thinking of what if I just go deeper? What would happen? Because uh, the suicidal ideations, the thoughts, I have to live with them every day every other day for the rest of my life. That, that just that stuff just doesn't go away. So it, I always had it in my head. I think in January, I just, it's like, oh, therapy's not helping. Nothing's working. I still feel this way, still hate myself. What's the point of living if I have to live with these thoughts all the time? So that was the first attempt. Yeah, that's a powerful clip. I think, um, you know, when she talks about, you can hear her, the the segment talking about where she's talking to herself that there's, what's the point? There's no more options. And I think that's that's a critical phase of, of mental health, that the moment you feel that there's nowhere else to turn, suicide becomes a realistic, viable option. You know, and I think that's where, if you can recognize that when, when patients are unable to sort of identify what they can do to to feel better, um, that becomes a critical point where they really, suicide becomes a really high probability. And I think uh, one of the things that we try to do, at least in our EDs, it, it, you know, we, we there's a thing called a safety plan. So when a kid comes in or an adult comes in, if they had suicidal thoughts, we always put uh, a safety plan. The safety plan is, a, it's an evidence-based tool. It basically gets, the patient or the child to talk about when I feel that there's no other options and they literally list in order in their handwriting I'm gonna call my pet dad I'm gonna do this they're gonna write every possible contact or emergency uh, person to reach out to so that they can look at this piece of paper 
to at least give them a shot to say, hey, I know you're thinking that you don't have any options, but remember when you wrote this, mm -hmm. here are some options that you wrote in your own handwriting to break that sort of cycle of I don't have any more options. Um, it's something that I, you know, we, we do at HMH, every patient that is suicidal or had self-injurious behavior before they leave the ED, they put in their packet. On our inpatients, they do that. I think it's something um, that a lot of healthcare institutions do. They, they, they use safety planning, but it really speaks to, we, we really need to provide supports. And, and you know, we, we talk about technology and AI. How do we keep connected to patients when we're not connected to them between appointments, right? And I mm -hmm. think this is where I'm really excited about using, you know, digi digital media apps, you know, using social media in a positive way to, to remain connected with um, these patients that have, they're at risk to remind them that we are here, we're here to help you, we're here to engage with you and give you options if you're feeling that way, so. I think that's great. And I think it ties in because she also kind of talks about this as like a long term, you know, like I've, I always deal with these emotions and stuff like that. Um, do you think for somebody who, you know, has experienced these kind of dark thoughts and stuff, like, is there ever a point in time where it's like totally behind them? Or do you think people still carry? I mean, I think she said it best, right? Yeah. You could, I, she knew that once she did that, it was going to stay with her forever. It becomes mm -hmm. part of you, which I think it, you know, if you think about trauma and, you know, near death experiences, these things happen, right? They don't, they become part of you. Just yeah. like anyone that experiences loss or grief of a loved one, right? It, it, it becomes part of who you are. Um, it's, it's not to say that's good or bad. Right. It just, it's just part of us. And, and, how we overcome that is making sure that we have the support with our families, that we, we're able to reach out to people and connect with them and talk about these things, right? That sense of community that we talked about, I think that's really important to understand that when patients get into these spaces, we need to rally around them, right? We need to give them the resources, the support, the validation and the empathy and, and, and you know, the professionalism and specialty that they need to get out of these, uh, you know, mental health disorders. Yeah, you make a good point. And Jasmine also touches on this, which I'll show you in the next clip. Um, just using her her experience to kind of shape who she is and where she's gone and how she shares her story with other people and how she copes. Like like you said, it does stay with you. But for her, I think it helped her grow in such like an incredible way. So let me yeah. just show you this one. Writing, I wrote a lot. And writing is still something that is very helpful to me and also grounding exercises so things are simply as reminding of you to be in the moment because when you're anxious when you're depressed sometimes you linger on the past or you get anxious about the future or you're upset about present things but questions like where am i what day is it what am i wearing how do my clothes feel what's the weather reminding of you where you are and how safe it is. Oh, I love that. I mean, it, that clip really shows that she has come such a long way to understand that when, one, she's insightful enough to recognize that when she gets in that space, to be mindful and, and pull herself back from going down that path of negativity, right? I think it's it talks about, you know, she talks about mindfulness, she talks about breaking the cycle of not feeling the way to continue feeling the way she feels um you know these things are going to happen but it doesn't have to define you right and i think that's really the take-home message that this jasmine could have easily said you know i'm no good i'm self i'm not worthy i'm not good enough and she could have had that be her defining moment but the reality is that she realized that i i can control this i can have the ability to do things rather than cut myself to ask what does my sweater feel like you know what is what's the what's the room feel like you know be mindful to get her out of that space um and and that's just terrific work from her i mean i it's it's great to see this segment where she can actually go back and it's i think it's good for people that listen to really understand that to get from the point of the start where she was to now is a process and it's a journey um, some of it's shorter for others and longer for, for other people. It varies. But I think to get to that point and understand that there is hope at the end, is that, I think that's the power in Jasmine's story is that if you just keep pushing, um, th good things will happen. So Yeah. 
that's kind of how she closes out our conversation too she talks a bit about just uh, I ask her you know what kind of advice would you give young Jasmine or what advice would you give someone who's listening who may be coping with similar experiences that you've had and she talks about just you know like you have that power to make this change for yourself and like don't you want to live a better life and and things like that and i think she does a really nice job of coming from a place of understanding and knowing it but also being able to share what's helped her so anyone listening watching they can you can go back and watch jasmine's full story and she shares a lot there but um i think her her way about it is just really powerful because she she totally understands it that's yeah. great well dr El Sarah, do you have any final tips for anyone who maybe is a parent or someone who's watching and relates to jasmine or just anyone in general trying to better their life yeah i, I know i talked a lot and i gave a lot of information but i think um, if you're going to take anything home think of the three c's right think of confidence communication and community, right? Kids are gonna question their confidence and it's your job as a parent and a coach and and an adult to figure out what else is going to make them confident. Find the superpower in them and and hit that nerve as much as you can so that they feel confident, not for for many other reasons, not only by self-image or or stereotypes that the communities perpetuate that aren't good. Remember to communicate, and that means to communicate, to open lines of communication just to talk, but learn how to have those hard communications and do it early. Do it early enough so that kids can sort of check and, and, and with not only with you, but within themselves. That external communication is important, but internal communication is even more important. Have them sort of check themselves. How am I feeling? How do I manage this? How do I get information to manage these informations internally so that I can function and be more confident. And then the last one is community. Make sure that, you know, get them involved with doing things. Teach them to be involved with sports, with community activities. It teaches them empathy. It teaches them that there are other people around besides your family that are there to support them and help them and love them and care for them. I love that. Those are great takeaways. Thank you so much again for coming back on the podcast. We love having you here. Uh, And thanks so much for taking the time to go through Jasmine's story. Thank you. The information shared is one individual's personal experience and is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice, medical diagnosis, treatment, or care. If you or a loved one is struggling with mental illness or has suicidal thoughts, don't hesitate to reach out for help and dial 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline or proceed to your local emergency room.